You've all got Jerusalem finally a peaceful abode, verse 20 to 24? Yes. Um, by the way, if you look at verse 10, 18, and 22, there's one word or concept that's repeated three times in each one of those verses. Verse 10, what have you got? Okay. Verse 18. Where? Yeah, where? Where is who? <laughs> it's it's the one that's seeing something. That's the concept there. Okay, where is the scribe, the one who reads? Where is the receiver, the one who sees and gets the message? Where is the one who counts towers, the one who looks out for the defenses? Okay. Uh, and also in verse, what did I say? 22. Verse 22, another word. Lord. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. What's the emphasis here? For me? Not well. Maybe there isn't. Um, but um, it's just interesting that in three verses in the same chapter you have three words or three concepts that are repetitive, it's, I think it's and it's worth uh, worth meditating on to see whether there is a connection. Concept is connected because he said, "Ten, I will rise. I will be exalted. Mm -hmm. I will." Well, he emphasized about. The Jehovah I, I. Mm -hmm. and the ten, the eighteen is where is the, the person who the human and scribe and receiver and the the first the tower they can yeah yeah but the end the twenty two is Lord is judge Lord is lawgiver Lord is king yeah is yeah. Connected. yeah I think so. I think there is something there to think about okay three 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 uh -huh. three passages yes in, uh, yeah. Yes. <coughs> All right. So we're moving on now to chapter thirty-four. Very good observation. It's interesting. Yeah. Three, three, three. Mm -hmm. Chapter thirty-four. We have God's vengeance against the nations, and now, incidentally, we break into almost a an a, a apocalyptic uh, mode again, just like we did previously. Remember, there were a whole bunch of judgments, and then bang, suddenly we're into Revelation type literature where we see the heavens and the stars and the moon and involved in God's judgment. And uh, certainly that is the case in verses 1 to 4, where there is cataclysmic judgment upon the cosmos. Come near, you nations, to hear, and hearken, you people, to hear. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out. Their stink shall come up out of their carcasses. And the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falls off from the vine. And as a falling fig from the fig tree. So, uh, boy, this is this is a major... Um, major judgment upon the cosmos. Uh, verses 5 to 17, the world symbolized by Edom. The world symbolized by Edom. Notice in verse... Where is Edom mentioned here? Interesting. I think it's only shown in the NIV that this is Edom that we're talking about. Did he, uh, yeah, midway, verse 5. Verse 5? Yes. It, um, oh, Edomia, that's right, which is Edom. Okay. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, what? Am I lost or what here? Chapter 34, verse... Five. 
here, I, okay, chapter 34, verse 5. My sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. Okay. Behold, it shall come down upon Edomia, and uh, in, it really is Edom, the people I have totally destroyed, upon the people of my curse to judgment. Um, the blood bath is likened to sacrifice, verses 5 to 7. The blood bath is likened or sa er, compared to sacrifice. Notice verse verse six. Uh, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams, for the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra, and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. But I believe that Edom is being used as a type of the world here. Verses 8 to 17. Terrible destruction on the land leaves it suitable only for wild animals. Suitable only for wild animals. 8 to 17. And I'm not going to break it down any further. But I do want you to notice that the language here is very similar to the language you read after Babylon is destroyed. And the same words are used that would imply uh, habitation of evil spirits, as you have with Babylon when it's wasted, because the same word for wild goats are used, and night creatures there is like uh, more uh, the, the superstitious language of the people that day. Uh, on that, that note to the terrible destruction, mm -hmm. you said on the land, this is suitable only for wild animals. In prophecy last year, we were talking about this, and we were, we were discussing the prophecy in every I shall see him, and oh. all these little interpretations they have, well, Jesus will circle the world, or he'll remain in the heavens and the world will return, you know, and everyone will see him. But um, I was just like thinking, my own, my own thoughts are possibly, you know, with all this destruction, of the tribulation and all the destruction, like a third of the people killed, a third of the ships, a third of the seas, that possibly that eastern part of the world where Judah is may be the only inhabitable place left in that section of the world. Like maybe over here in North America, it's going to be totally wiped out. Wasteland. Just a wasteland, no people. So that when when the Lord comes, maybe all people that are even going to be left on the earth, especially when you think about Armageddon, you know, all these people coming together to fight, that the only people left on the earth will be around Jerusalem, so they will be able to see him in the sky. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going too far? Well, think about it too, there's going to be much TV left after the situation. I think most of those things are going to be wiped out. Most communication. Communication is usually the first thing that is, is attacked in military strategy. But, uh, I really don't know. I have some, it's a good thought anyway. Yeah. Just think it seems to make a little more sense than Jesus hovering in the heaven for a whole day while everyone gave it a chance. To try to buy a property in, de in that area. Try to buy it? Try to buy a property in that area. Oh, red, yeah. red, then <laughs> <Indian. laughs> Good investment. Invest now in land that will not be fried. Okay. Um, last chapter and we're done. Believe it or not. Chapter 35, The Joy of the Redeemed. Oh, by the way, a footnote to the city of Basra. Basra means grape gathering. And a uh, place where you gather the grapes is where you stomp out the juice. And it's a depiction again of, of the blood that's going to flow freely. The Cup of Wrath. So, now we have the joy of the redeemed, chapter 35, verses 1 to 10. First of all, verse 1 to 2, the land is restored and reflects the glory of the Lord. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and shining. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. The excellency of our God. 
Verses 3 to 4, fearful hearts are encouraged. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Verses 5 to 7, the people and the land healed. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and the streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And then in verse 8 to 10, the highway to Zion will be established. And it will not be the Queen Elizabeth way. It won't even be the King's highway. It will be called the Holy Way, the way of holiness. Mm-hmm. The way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. Fools shall not err therein. Well, let's see what it says here. Uh, no lion will be there. Wait a well, there's a bit of a translation problem here, obviously. The highway will be there, be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. That's what NIV says, and here it says even fools will walk on it. Mine says the fools will not err. Even fools will not err? Yeah. No, that's King James. Yeah. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Did I hear a sigh? <laughs> <sighs> End of class. <laughs> sigh. Last <laughs> comment. Uh, Before we get into this passage, let me just explain a couple of things. I've given you some additional reading. Bob has always asked me for extra homework, so you can blame him. Um, But a must for a reading assignment is 2 Kings chapter 18 to 20. Uh, That's um, another parallel to to Isaiah 36 to 39. And also 2 Chronicles chapter 29 to 32. Now it might seem a little repetitive to you because uh, it looks like in some some parts uh, the passage is borrowed word for word from Isaiah, which is not a problem. Uh, I don't have any problem with the doctrine of inspiration if I see one author copying another author uh, for historical purposes. That's not uh, uh, inspiration is not defined in such a way that uh, that is not allowed in our definition of inspiration or understanding of inspiration. So you must read Second Kings eighteen to twenty, and Second Chronicles twenty nine to thirty two. That's right on your notes here, Chang. Uh, Also, I've given you a handout that deals with a problem in our chronology. And I thought that this would be a good thing for you to do because, uh, I don't know about you, but I have a problem with history. I find history very difficult to get into, especially when you're dealing with uh, before Christ era, before the Christian era. And... um, um, the problem that we have in Isaiah chapter 36 
is that in verse 1 it says, Now it came to pass in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah that Zanacharib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. There is a big argument as to whether this is the fourteenth year or the twenty-fourth year. And uh, in the Hebrew language it's quite easy to do to mix up your figures. The only problem is there are no extant manuscripts that are variant at, on this reading. If it was the 24th year, the chronology would work out perfectly. Because it says 14th, it doesn't seem to work out. So I've given you um, a handout to read and to study and to come up with uh, maybe an explanation that uh, you think doesn't violate inspiration or inerrancy. Um, or perhaps you might be satisfied with saying that uh, there must be a manuscript with a variant reading that we haven't discovered yet. But in that case, we have a problem with the doctrine of preservation, okay? Because we believe that God has preserved his word, and his preserved word are in, is in the extant manuscripts, right? Isn't that what we believe? Is that what is taught in, in bibliology? Okay. So, if we are to say, well, let's just change this to the 24th year of King Hezekiah, but we have no manuscripts to back that up, we just think a scribe made an error somewhere along the way, then we have to go back and redefine what we mean by preservation. <laughs> okay, That gets into the area of bibliology, and you've taken that course already, so you can apply what you've learned to solving this problem. Okay, uh, I think this author of the article that I gave you wimped out a little bit, uh, and just conveni conveniently said uh, it must have been 24 years, but we don't have any copy of a manuscript that says so. Um, tell me what you think and come up with an answer and give it to me on Monday. Let's discuss that on Monday, okay? I don't want a, a written paper or anything. I just want your best thoughts on it. What is briefly? Briefly, in verse 1, 36, 36 yeah. it says the 14th year of King Hezekiah. Yeah. Somehow it doesn't work out. Oh. And I want you to read that article that I gave you to understand the problem yeah. and solve the problem, if, oh. you, if you can solve it. If you can't solve it, you say, I don't know. Oh. But study it. Oh. Okay? Study the problem. And also the other oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Is that understood? Okay. Alright. Okay, and you might want to do up a nice chart that shows us exactly how you see the history, the chronology fitting in. That would help me. Because I have difficulty seeing everything in my mind historically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we should have a list for the class and then one for Bob. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and entitle it, What About Bob? Have you seen that movie? Yeah, no. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Let's begin now with chapter 36. Entitle chapter 36, uh, The Assyrian Invasion of 701 B.C. Now, again, the date might be off. You might want to correct me on that. The Assyrian Invasion of 701 B.C. This is chapter 36, verses 1 to 22. In verses 1 to 3, now you understand that we are out of the prophetic section and we are into the historical interlude. Uh, we come to an end for a while with the poetry and the song and we pick up with historical narrative here, okay? Um, we have in verses 1 to 3 the approach of Assyria and the meeting of the leaders. You might call this a leadership summit. But this is more like, uh, you know, you've seen in the Westerns um, where, um, you know, the Indian chief and his right-hand man leave uh, their soldiers behind and ride into the middle of the field and the captain of the cavalry takes his bugler or whatever and rides into the middle of the field on their horses and there they have a palaver, you know. Uh, well, this is a, a similar kind of thing. King Zanakarib remains behind in the city of Lachish, Lachish, or Lachish, however you want to pronounce it, uh, and sends Rab-Shaka 
Sounds like a good old uh, Afro-American uh, name, a eh? Rob Shaka. Uh, Rob Shaka from Lachish to Jerusalem to King Hezekiah. And um, that's where the designated ones or the delegates of King uh, Zanakarib meet with the delegates of King Hezekiah. And they have their palaver, they have their powwow. And uh, what is meant to be uh, a personal powwow, a personal uh, exchange of terms, uh, becomes an opportunity for Zanakarib's um, delegate, Rabshaka, to, um, to verbally terrorize the people on the wall who are uh, watching this uh, discussion take place. By the way, uh, the place where these leaders meet is significant. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3, if you'll remember, King Ahaz is met by Isaiah at a spot in Jerusalem. Do you remember the spot? Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field exactly the same spot where these guys meet now but look at what he says there and say unto him take heed and be quiet fear not neither be faint-hearted now I wonder if that message lies in anyone's memory besides Isaiah at any rate they have been told by the king to keep quiet because in the end of chapter 36 after Rabshakeh does his thing, we read that um, in verse 21, But they held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was saying, Answer him not. Um, at any rate, they, I think that uh, the fact that they meet in the same place is significant because this is where Isaiah was first told by the Lord, and Isaiah told Ahaz that... Uh, uh, the Assyrians would not win. Um, <clears throat> so we have the approach of Assyria and the meeting of the leaders. Now it came to pass in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah that Zanakrib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defensed cities of Judah and took them. Remember the prediction that he would take them one by one. They would just fold like a deck of cards one after another until he got to the vicinity of Jerusalem. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. Now remember the story of um, Eliakim, or Eliakim, and um, um, Shebna. Shebna was apparently... Uh, over Eliakim, or Eliakim, uh, but now the order is reversed and Eliakim is the chief honcho, uh, something like uh, Secretary of State, if you want to call it that, and Shebna would be his scribe, uh, the recorder, the one who takes everything down, maybe the king's historiographer, and um, <clears throat> they are the ones who are delegated then to deal with the Assyrian delegates. Verses 4 to 6, Rabshaka seems to be quite a verbal, outspoken kind of guy, and he speaks Hebrew fluently. Um, and we find out later that he is speaking Hebrew here, and he begins to question their confidence in Egypt, because, of course, Israel or Judah has made uh, an alliance, uh, entered into a treaty with Egypt against God's wishes. In verses 4 to 6, Ray, Rab, I'm just going to call him Rab for short, he questions their confidence in Egypt. Rabshakeh said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain words, I have counsel and strength for war, 
Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. What he's saying is Egypt is not a reliable partner. And in fact, I've read historically that Egypt was notorious for not following through on its commitments. And think about this. Think about the logistics of, um, of Egypt's forces helping Judah. So how, how far, I mean, you have to cross the desert to get to Egypt. Uh, and so they're dealing with a logistical nightmare um, to effectively be able to help Jerusalem. And uh, sure enough, even God predicts that Egypt will fail them and that the treaty will entirely fail. The alliance will not hold. And Rabshakeh sees this from a practical point of view, and he says, uh, the reed that you're leaning on is going to end up piercing your hand as you lean on it. That's the picture you get. Like uh, like leaning on a cane, and the cane has a point, and it injures you rather than helping you, uh, rather than supporting you. So Rabshakeh questions their confidence in Egypt. I just wanted to read verse 5 in the NIV. Uh, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says, On what are you basing this confidence of your, yours? You say you have strategy and military strength, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Okay. Verse 7, Rab questions their confidence in God. And I find it a little bit humorous here, but in questioning their confidence in God, he reveals his own ignorance of monotheism. He, coming from a polytheistic culture, does not understand something about this God of Israel, this God of Judah. He says, If thou say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar? Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, What is your God going to do to you for tearing down his high places? These high places were places of idolatry, and what he was criticizing was actually a source of Judah's strength. Okay. So, don't you often find this, that uh, an unsafe person will taunt you out of ignorance and don't they don't have a clue what they're talking about? I think it's kind of neat to have an, a window here on, uh, on a, a pagan's uh, ignorance as he tries to taunt. Uh, and I wonder how many Jews listening on the wall snickered about that one. <laughs> but anyway, he stepped in at that time. <coughs> Wrong information. Wrong information, that's right. Maybe maybe one of his assistants tugged on his sleeve and says, not a good thing to say, that's not a good thing to say. But uh, at any rate, he taunts them, and he continues to taunt them verbally in verses 8 to 10. Look at the nature of the taunt. Now for therefore give pledges, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give thee two thousand horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. In other words, the condition is, you find me 2,000 men who are capable of riding on horses, and I'll give you 2,000 horses. Just a lie. And, uh, of course, he knows that they don't have what it takes. They don't have the riders. The point being, if you don't have even 2,000 men who can ride horses, how are you going to resist our cavalry that have far more than 2,000? I mean, we are just going to blow you away. You cannot resist. It is futile to resist. So, he um, taunts them with the weakness of their army. Um, again, he taunts the weakness of the alliance with Egypt. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants? 
and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen. Now, this is a pretty effective taunt. Because, think about this, here you have a non-believer, a pagan, who probably knows very little about uh, the prohibition in Deuteronomy about a king acquiring horses and chariots. Okay? All the Jews listening on the wall would certainly twig in their mind back to Deuteronomy. Number one, they are guilty before God for depending on Egypt for chariots and horses. And number two, they're breaking God's commandment. And here, through the mouth of a pagan, they are being reminded through a taunt. Now, if that doesn't strike fear in the natural man's heart, you know, uh, I mean, it ought to. They ought to have been shaken in their boots here. Because it's like God speaking through the pagan's mouth here to remind them of the way they messed up. Thirdly, in verse 10, he says, And am I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, Go up against this land and destroy it. <laughs> ah. Here's this pagan who presumes to know the mind of God. And incidentally, all through the book of Isaiah, didn't we read that the Lord would raise up Assyria to judge and bring vengeance upon Israel and upon Judah and upon Jerusalem? Some, well, he's mostly right, but he's just a little bit wrong. Some it looks like why you rely on the Egypt. That kind of saying is very uh, uh, the biblical, eh? but the wrong information about the uh, altar. Yeah. Uh, so when we careful reason that, it looks powerful, but <laughs> just uh, it looks powerful, but it's shot through with contradiction. You know, first of all, he didn't know their God. Secondly, he didn't know that the prophecy, the prediction was that Assyria was going to be killed in this confrontation. He didn't have the complete truth. He only had partial truth. And by the way, you've, you all know by now that Satan never comes at you or seldom comes at you with a total blatant lie. He always comes at you with partial truth and uh, and slowly departs from the truth and uh, the enemy of God's people here is doing the same thing he's coming at them with partial truth and seeking to terrorize them with partial truth uh, at the same time I think God uses it in order to teach his children a lesson doesn't justify the lying, doesn't justify the terrorism, but God uses it yeah, uh, to chastise. In another sense, it might be said to go up against this land and destroy it. God, God might have told them what God, because God wants to use them to chastise to that. Mm -hmm. But as long as they are tool, God can change his mind when the Hezekiah did repent. Well, in fact, though, Isaiah had already predicted that the king of Assyria would not totally just destroy Jerusalem. Isn't that correct? Yeah, that they would be that a remnant would be preserved, that Assyria would uh, be turned back. Well, that will come after Hezekiah's prayer here. Um, following this, we have um, Hezekiah's delegates, Eliakim and Shebna and Joah, who say unto Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language, which means Aramaic. Speak Aramaic, please. There's a couple of reasons for this. Why? So only the kings and rulers will hear him not all the common people. Okay, that's number one. Number two, it was the protocol of the day. For delegates, for... for um, it's like um, when when officials of uh, political leaders meet for talks on treaties and trade and uh, that sort of thing, there's always a protocol to follow. And uh, commentators tell us that 
uh, the protocol of uh, officialdom in that day was that the Aramaic language was the language to be used. But Rab, good old Rab, feels pretty cocky, and he doesn't respect their request at all. In fact, he very likely raises his voice even louder. Um, the verse here says, Speak not to us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. And Rab Shekha said, Hath my master sent me to my thy master to and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, uh, that eat their own dung and drink their own urine with you? Um, why did he say that? I remember, this is the verse that, uh, as a little kid, I would find and snicker over because I always thought these were bad words. When someone showed it to me, I thought, no, can't be. This is the Bible. It doesn't use words like that. Um, yeah, they're in siege conditions. This is what happening. Okay. They're not in, under siege yet, but he's predicting that they will be. Okay. He's saying, uh, look, at you guys, he's saying this so the people on the wall can hear it. You guys on the wall, you're going to be eating your own refuse and you're going to be drinking your own urine. That's how bad it's going to get. So the request to speak in Aramaic didn't work, and um, the response was an additional taunt, additional verbal terror. Verses 13 to 20, Rab resumes to question their confidence, this time specifically in their king and in their god. Seems to be a pretty strong contradiction on one hand when Rabshakeh says your God told us to come up against you and, and at the same time poke fun at their God and telling them don't trust in him uh, here is a reference to verse 12 in that time The Samaria is not Samaria, but they time they they eat the cheese during the siege. Yeah. You'd have to read uh, the accounts in Chronicles and Kings, Second Kings and Second Chronicles, because there is more history given there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so <coughs> um, from verses. 13 to 20, Rab questions their confidence in their king and in their God. In verses 13 and 15, he says, Don't trust in the God of Hezekiah. Then Rab Shakah stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. He's quoting the Lord. Okay, don't trust Hezekiah and don't trust in his God. Don't trust in the God who says the city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. You see? Um, verses 16 to 17, he's saying, Don't bank on your own provisions. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and eat ye every one of his vine, and every one of his own fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. So he's saying here, your crops are going to fail, your own... Um, and it was every Jewish man's pride to have his own fig tree in his backyard, perhaps, and uh, his own vine, maybe. Um, and uh, so what he's doing is he's striking at their very sustenance here and uh, the things that every man enjoys about his own backyard, you know. He's saying, uh, don't, don't listen to Hezekiah. And don't, uh, you won't 
you won't continue with your lifestyle you're gonna lose it um, so don't bank on your own provisions thirdly don't trust in the Lord's promise of deliverance well that's kind of through the whole passage you know it's kind of hard to divvy up the passage and categorize it neatly because some of these threads are throughout verses 18 to 20 don't trust in the Lord's promise of deliverance beware lest Hezekiah persuade you saying the Lord will deliver us hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king as king of Assyria where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad where are the gods of Sepharvaim and have they delivered Samaria out of my hand who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand but they held their peace and answered him not a word for the king's commandment was saying answer him not um, he's just enumerating all of the nations and cities and uh, their gods apparently that fell before them and he's saying look at look at our track record none of them none of them have survived and you think your God is going to deliver you these are some pretty powerful arguments I'd like you to think for a moment maybe to reflect and to meditate on the enemy's strategy with us and see if you can find some similar ways and strategies that uh, that Satan uses in our lives very reasonable very reasonable very rational yeah. well the rapture that we think seem nice like we'll take you to your land like your own land you know things will be okay yeah you have your own you know things to do there what does it say exactly Um, yeah you, you, you will eat of your own vine and of your own fig tree if you give in to us now we'll let you continue what you've got for a little while until we come and take you away to a land like your own land a land of corn and wine a land of bread and vineyards you know what the combination is here that is always effective for most people is a combination of a lot of fear and a little bit of hope a lot of fear and a little bit of hope if you read the story of uh, the um, the Holocaust and you ask the question how is it that the Nazis with relatively few men were able to incarcerate hundreds and thousands of Jews and political dissidents in these camps in these prison camps without a major uprising there were some uprisings but they were easily put down because the majority of the inmates held back didn't want to get involved because they thought it would ruin their chances and uh, so and it's it's a it's a documented fact that the Nazis used the strategy of a lot of fear and a little bit of hope don't take all hope away as long as you leave a little door of hope open, mm. it gives a person something to live towards. Then become a selfish to escape, to, to, to be safe. Yes. Take that hope. It takes, it takes your motivation to escape away because you think the risk of escaping is a greater risk than the probability of achieving that hope. Notice they always give him choices. You go through the left door, you die. You go through the right door, you live okay so so you're standing in line and you're thinking what are my chances if I try to escape right now my chances are like 90 percent death 10 percent survival my chances of surviving this choice here is 50 50 I think I'll just take this chance here okay and they always they put strategic decisions in their way and made them think that the choice was theirs and combine that with a lot of fear and a little bit of hope here we have a lot of fear and a little bit of hope. Look at you stay here. You're going to be eating your own poop. You're going to be drinking your own urine. Uh, you're going to be eating your own children's flesh. He didn't say that here. Um, and you will not be enjoying the fruit of your own vine. 
you come with us and uh, you, you, you will have all that you know and they're thinking yeah right you know but there's a lot of fear involved here and they're thinking well maybe maybe he's right look at all those other cities that fell and uh, so as soon as you begin to take your eyes off the Lord and stop listening to his word and you listen to the rationale of the enemy and you begin to you know think it through and you entertain those thoughts and before you know it you've caved in so if, if that time the Jewish male they if they are rebellion in the camp or during the process of the, the trans, transportation from the various area to the Polish camp mm -hmm. they they can quite a number they can escape because they cannot handle all they cannot kill or arrest it and they, they at, the, at one time they escape or rebellion yeah but they just be followed by the, the Nazis 